let's take out our Bibles and learn together. In our last study, we saw that Yeshua was invited to one of the leaders of the Pharisees for Shabbat in order to have a meal with these individuals. But it just wasn't one of the leaders of the Pharisees. We see also that there were experts of the law who were also invited. And we learned something. The purpose of this meal was not to truly host him, but rather there was an attempt to discredit him, to shame him, to embarrass him. And what do we see? That there was a man there who had a very painful condition. His hand swelled greatly, and because of that, he was in terrible suffering. And what did Yeshua do? He asked those who were the experts in the law. He asked them, is it lawful for me to heal on Shabbat? And what were they? They were silent. Now, realize that that is most significant because these were the experts, and he asked a rather simple question. Anyone who understands the purpose of Shabbat would know that it's a day of restoration. And we've talked about before how God would do something, that God would heal on Shabbat. There was the tradition within Judaism and every synagogue throughout the world, and that tradition still is present. And that is after the reading of the Torah on Shabbat, what is done? We would pray for those who are sick, that God might alleviate their pain and suffering, that they might experience a kingdom blessing. When? Specifically on Shabbat. Why? As we talked about, there is a relationship between Shabbat and the kingdom of God. When we see things happening on Shabbat, they give us a kingdom perspective. We're also going to see at the end of our study in this lesson that there's going to be a reference to the resurrection. And likewise, the resurrection is what it appears in the scripture. It is a reference to the kingdom of God. Why? Because there will be a great resurrection in order that the kingdom will be established, in order that those who died in the past, in faith, in that covenantal relationship with God, in order that they would be resurrected for their kingdom experience. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 14, the book of Luke, Chapter 14, we're going to begin in verse 7. And there we read, But he was saying to the ones who had been invited, meaning invited to this Shabbat observance, this meal at the leader of the Pharisees, he was saying to them a parable. Now, why did he say this parable? Notice what is continuing in the same verse. Having paid attention to how all the first seats, the best seats, they had chosen, saying to them, and he wants to now instruct them, he saw that they were not humble, but they were using the Shabbat as an instrument to exalt themselves. That is not the kingdom attitude. They did not have a kingdom decision-making process going on. They were thinking of themselves. They did not understand one of the foundational principles of the kingdom of God. And what is that? To love your neighbor as yourself. They weren't thinking of others. They were thinking only of themselves. And that is in conflict with the kingdom mindset. Keep reading verse 8. He says, whenever you should be invited by someone to a wedding, do not recline at the best seats, lest someone more honorable than you 
having been invited by this one. So there's a situation where if you go and you take the best seats, perhaps there'll be another one who is closer. It says here, more precious, more honorable to the host will come. And he will want that one who is closer to him, more honorable than you, that he would take a better seat. And that's exactly what we see in the next verse. Look at verse 9. And the one having invited, and the implication is you and him, should say to you, give to this one a place, meaning give to this one who the host is closer to, who from his perspective is more honorable, that he should come to both of you and say to you, you, meaning this one who took of his own initiative a, a great seat in that, that banquet, that this one should come and say to you, give to him a place, meaning your place. And look at the end of verse 9. And then you shall begin with shame, the last place to take. So we see something. When we act in light of wanting to exalt self, what are we going to actually be experiencing? What's that key word that we find here? Shame. And he's teaching us a principle. If we have that kingdom mindset, we're not going to be thinking of self, but we're going to be thinking of others. And we are going to want to exalt them. We are going to want to be a blessing to them. We are going to demonstrate, if we're kingdom-minded, we are going to demonstrate humility. These individuals were demonstrating humility. They were not thinking of that kingdom character, that kingdom mindset. They were only thinking of themselves, exalting themselves. And therefore, he warns them that that attitude is going to lead to shame. And that's why he says in this verse, the one having invited you and him, that this one after coming should say to you, give to this one, this other person, a place, meaning your place, and then you shall begin with shame, having taken the last seat. Now look at verse 10. He says, but whenever you are invited, go, and what's interesting here is that this word for going is in the passive, meaning that you should go being, being led by something. And what is that? A humble spirit based upon his instructions. That if you're kingdom minded, and here's the key if you understand the truth of Shabbat, that God, think of this, when we look at the very first Shabbat, and where is that appearing in the scripture? In the book of, of Genesis and chapter 2. Think that God not only created you, but he also stopped having prepared everything in these first six days of creation. You being the chief thought. Why? Well, there's a principle in Judaism, and that is first in thought is last indeed. And what does that mean? Well, think of it based upon our example. You have desired, your thought, your primary thought is to have house guests, to invite someone for dinner. And what do you do? There's a lot that goes into that. For example, oftentimes we, we get our house ready, we clean it and make it look nice to honor our guests. Then we go out and we, we purchase, we shop, we buy food and everything we need. And then we prepare the food. We set the table. Everything gets, gets ready. And then the last thing that is done is to welcome your guests and to feed them. So the principle is this. First in thought is the last thing that is done, the last experience. And therefore, what we see in the six days of creation is that God prepares everything in this world for mankind in order that, that he 
would do something. He created us on the sixth day, the last thing that was created on the sixth day, showing that we were his primary thought. And then what did he do? This holy, perfect, sovereign God. He ceased. He Shabbat. That's literally what it says. Shabbat, we think of it as a noun, the Sabbath day, but it's also a verb. And he ceased. He stopped. Why? That this God, this awesome God, that he would want to have fellowship, have intimacy with you and me. That should humble ourselves. And therefore, that fact should cause us to approach Shabbat humbly. But these individuals did not. Let's move on to the next verse, verse 10, where he says, And whenever you be invited, go, and that is to be led to go with this humble thought, and recline at the last place in order that whenever the one who has invited you should come, that he should say to you, friend, move up where? To a better place. Move up higher to a more honorable seat. And why is that important? Well, he says, keep reading in verse verse 11. He says, actually the end of verse 10, then there will be to you glory before the ones who are reclining with you so we see something if we have that kingdom mindset and we see that connection between the kingdom and shabbat if we approach shabbat properly humbly realizing that this is the day that god has sanctified and again i want to say he did not say to us you know there's seven days in the week you choose your day of rest he didn't say that the scripture says that he specifically sanctified the seventh day in order that he would have fellowship intimacy friendship with us and therefore that should humble us and what does the scripture teach us teaching us now very simply on this shabbat he's teaching that you're either based upon your mindset if you have a kingdom mindset or not you are either going to be experiencing shame or glory now that is exactly what everyone is going to experience when the kingdom of god is established you will either be with him and that term with him relates to redemption as a word with is a redemptive word You are either going to be with him in the kingdom where you are going to be experiencing the glory of God being in his presence or you are going to be cast out outside where there is darkness, that is fear, where there is weeping, which is sorrow and sadness, and where there is gnashing of the teeth, where there is torment. And realize these three things, fear, sadness and torment are eternal so you are either going to experience eternal shame and suffering or you're going to experience the blessings of god the promises of god where in the presence of god that's the choice and therefore because the kingdom of god is so marvelous so wonderful therefore that fact that he has made it possible for you and me through faith in that gospel to be part of the kingdom we should be humble we should not be thinking of ourselves here's the example god did not think of himself but he blessed humanity with shabbat in order that we would experience him his love his presence his blessings and his favor All of that is related to the kingdom and that fact should humble us and cause us to have that kingdom mindset which is to love our neighbor as ourself. Look now to verse 11. There's a concluding statement. He says, because everyone who humbles himself, excuse me, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled. 
and the one who humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, that's just a universal kingdom principle. And it's true, always. He says here, look again at verse 11. He says, everyone, every person who exalts himself, they are going to be humbled. But the one who humbles himself, that one is going to be exalted. What's being emphasized? A proper understanding of Shabbat is going to minister humility to us, meaning when we rightly understand the Sabbath day and the history of it, what God has done going all the way back to the book of Genesis and specifically Genesis 2, God stopped all of his work. Why? Because he desired to spend that seventh day with humanity. And that should humble us and cause us to humble ourselves in front of others. These individuals weren't doing that. They were trying to exalt themselves by rushing to the, the finest seats at this banquet. Now, we move on to a second aspect. Look now to verse 12. But he said also to the one who invited him, whenever you make a supper or a dinner. So again, he's speaking about the right attitude that we should have when we have a banquet, a dinner, a supper, invite guests to our home. He says here, whenever you make a supper or a dinner, do not call to your friends, nor to your brothers, nor to your relatives, nor to your wealthy neighbors, lest also these, you, and the word here is to invite you back. So to be a, a, in a reciprocal relationship. He says, if you invite your, your wealthy friends, your relatives, your friends, or your, your family, he says, if you do that, they're going to do what? They're going to act in a reciprocal way and invite you to their place. What does he say to do? Look now. To, to the second part of verse 12, where he says, actually, verse, verse 13, where he says, but whenever you make, and he uses a different word, a party, a celebration, but whenever you make a celebration, call, and notice this, call the poor, the handicapped, the lame, the blind, and if we do that, notice what he says. If we, instead of inviting those individuals that have the means to pay us back, invite us to their home for a dinner, he says, rather, you need a different mindset. You need to be thinking not of yourselves, but others. There are individuals that don't have enough to eat, that, that people treat as outcasts. They ignore them. They don't like to be around them. So he says, when you make a, a celebration, a party, a banquet, when you're holding an event in your home, he says specifically, and this goes contrary to our mindset. He says, invite who? Not your friends, not your wealthy neighbors, not your brothers, and not your relatives. But rather, he says specifically, look at this verse, verse 13, where he says, But whenever you make this celebration, invite the poor, the handicapped, the lame, and the blind. And what will be the outcome? Look at this last verse. And you shall be blessed. Now that word, bless, makarios, is a very significant word in, in the Greek language. It, it parallels another word, and that is the Hebrew word, ashrei. Now, ashrei is well known among the Jewish community because it is the word 
that begins the afternoon prayer time. And it means blessed or happy. And we shouldn't think of it as either or, but both. And what God is saying here is this. When you act in that kingdom mindset, when you humble yourself and not want to exalt self, but think about the conditions of others, think about what they lack, think about their situation, their plight. And if you invite the poor, the handicapped, the paralyzed and the blind these are the ones that are ignored by society those who in order to survive they have to beg they have to rely upon the the generosity and the compassion of others and let's be honest this world is not all that compassionate it is a harsh world much in the way of suffering goes on in this world why not because there's a lack of resources but because we like to use our resources on self and what he's teaching here is that this is not the kingdom mindset this is not how god behaved god out of his love out of his generosity he created you and not only did he create you but because of human sin and we need to understand this rightly if you and i were in the garden of eden we would have done the same thing we would have sinned it was not that that first man adam and his wife kava were any different they behaved as humanity behaves it is our nature especially after the fall to be selfish to do what is right in our own eyes rather than relying upon and trusting and depending upon god's revelation his instruction so he says here look if you would to verse 14 and you will be happy or you will be blessed both of these things will be true because you do not have recompension you do not have this payback Uh, They don't have the means to pay you back. But it says here, for you will be paid back. When? At the resurrection of who? The righteous. Now, that last phrase says a lot. You will be paid back when? At the resurrection of the righteous. Now, that may be a term that you're not familiar with, but if you were to come from a Jewish background, the the resurrection of the righteous is a well-known doctrine. It is what happens that brings about a transition. What type of transition? A transition from this current world, which will be destroyed by the wrath of God, and there will be a godly transition into the establishment of his kingdom. Therefore, to enter into the kingdom, there has to be a change. What does Paul say? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We need to become a new creation. We need to become a new individual. And that only happens by redemption. And we find that redemption brings about a righteous change. Therefore, when we experience the redemption of the Messiah that comes through faith in him, and when we believe in him and his work, what work? His death upon the cross, him being buried but on the third day, rising from the dead. When we believe that and understand why he did it, why it was so necessary for us because of our sinfulness when we accept that we become that new creation what does paul say he says if anyone is in messiah they become a new creation the old things passed away behold all things are new and i've shared with you so many times that that word new as in a new covenant a new man the new jerusalem that word new relates to the kingdom So a new creation is a kingdom creation. 
And we become not just a new creation, but we are, by the grace of God, through the all-sufficiency of Messiah's work on the cross, we become righteous. Why? Because the scripture tells us that he took all of our sins from us when he was, was, was punished on that cross for your sin and mine. For the sins, the Bible says, of humanity. No limited atonement. That's a false teaching. A full and eternal redemption. That's what Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, purchased for us. And that purchase is a redemptive word. And therefore, he took all of our sins. And what did he do? He placed upon us those who believe, those who are justified by faith, not of works, those who have been reconciled to God the Father through his Son, through the work of the cross. He places upon us his very righteousness. Therefore, I can have absolute assurance that when I die, I'm going to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. I will be happy. I will be blessed. And that is my, my eternal future. Why? Because of the sufficiency of the cross. There's no doubt. Because it's not based upon what I've done, but what I've received by faith. And we learn in Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham had faith. He believed in God, God's, God's covenant. And what happened? God accounted it to him as righteousness. And that is my eternal future. To be declared righteous, I've already been declared righteous through faith in him, in Messiah Jesus. Therefore, I have assurance. And I know that when I go before God, he's not going to see all of my sins. He's forgotten those. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. What does he see? the perfect righteousness of his son. And therefore, I can have assurance that he is going to say to me, enter into eternal rest. And remember, rest is a word related to Shabbat. I'm going to have my eternal Shabbat, that is, to be with him in intimacy, in his glory forever and ever. Good news for humanity.